Okay, we are almost all loaded. So I would like to thank Brenda Berg, President and CEO of Best NC, and of course, Chairman McDowell for inviting me and including me in this. Um, this program is about the issues and the issues, issues around education. Dr. Jen Mangrum and Catherine, Ms. Catherine Truitt will join us and debate, if you will, how they may make a change if either one becomes state superintendent of education in the old state of North Carolina. I welcome the candidates and we'll, uh, as Chairman McDowell just did, I will give you an idea of a little bit of housekeeping and some of the rules of engagement. Um, and I'm, I'm reading this, so apologies. I just wanna make sure we get this right and do this by the numbers. Uh, each candidate will have an opening statement of, of approximately about a minute followed by a series of questions. Each candidate will have one minute to answer. And then the first candidate will have a 30 second um, uh, to provide a response and then a rebuttal. Uh, we welcome our guests to submit questions. So if you are a guest and watching this, please do submit a question via the chat function on the bottom of your screen. And you can send that question to Brenda Berg and Brenda will share that with me, hopefully seamlessly. And we'll be able to include that in our conversation over the next 45 minutes. So a lot of information and a lot of discussion to get into a short period of time. And we wanna do this. So again, welcome. Um, we flipped a coin prior to this uh, virtual broadcast. Dr. Jen Mangrum won that uh, toss, and we will start with her on an opening statement. Dr. Mangrum, uh, please tell us about yourself and tell us how student achievement will be improved after four years under your leadership if you are North Carolina's next state superintendent of education. Well, thank you, Chris and Walter and Brenda and everyone from Best NC. It's great to be here. Um, I have extensive experience in teaching. I spent 12 years in the classroom, two years as a literacy coach, and a year at the district office. I also have extensive knowledge. I have a BA in elementary education, a master's in early childhood, and I have a PhD, our terminal degree in our field, in curriculum and instruction. And then I have extensive experience in college of education. I've spent uh, a lot of time working on creating, implementing, and leading premier teacher education programs at both state and UNCG. Um, and teacher education does fall under this uh, DPI. Uh, I teach undergraduate and graduate courses, so I'm working with practicing teachers. Uh, I lead professional development across the country uh, with the National Paideia Center, which I've done for two decades. And then finally, until COVID, I was in classrooms twice a week supervising our interns and student teachers. So public schools are something I know and something I love. As the NNO said, I am the advocate for public schools and for teachers. Um, I would just add that my vision means that equity is the foundation of what we're going to do and what we're going to be about. Um, I have five core values I'm sure that I will cover um, across the next 45 minutes, but I know under my leadership that all children will flourish. D Dr. Mangrum, thank you. And it's decidedly low tech. If you see me hold my, my thumb up, um, that's going to tell you that your, your minute is, is up or close to being up. So I know you'll respect that, but I would just for our audience and I wanted everyone to know that that thumbs up means I don't like them on Facebook, but in fact means that we are running out of time. So uh, same question, Ms. Uh, Catherine Truitt. Uh, let, let me re re repeat it for you, Catherine. Tell us about yourself and how your student achievement will be improved after four years under your leadership if you are elected as North Carolina's State Superintendent of Education. Thanks so much, Chris and Brenda and Walter and, and all of the Bust NC members for your continued passion for improving outcomes for education in our state. I am a lifelong educator. I taught in the classroom for 10 years um, in various places around the country and overseas, following my husband around who was active duty Navy for 15 years. Um, I also have been a turnaround coach in high poverty schools nationally. Uh, I was Governor McCrory's education advisor. Uh, and now I lead a nonprofit 100% online university called Western Governors University, North Carolina. And our mission is to expand access to higher education for those who might not have it otherwise. I'm going to share with you what I believe to be, um, what, what I think should be our future state and what I promise to deliver if I am elected. So first, the Department of Public Instruction in four years will be known as a highly effective and efficient partner of the State Board of Education with a common mission and vision that puts students at the center of everything that we do. Second, the state will be anxiously awaiting in four years its first set of reading assessment scores for second graders, not third graders, 
Um, and because we will have been laser focused for the past four years on early literacy instruction through a statewide literacy campaign grounded in the science of reading. Okay. Catherine, also, uh, I hate to cut you off, but we're, we're gonna try to, and I know this is, this is not an exacting system, so we'll get our momentum once we go through, and I'm sorry to cut you off. And, and let me explain now. So as we get into the body of the dialogue and the debate, uh, candidate questions will cover uh, a lot of interest to the members of Best NC, like education, their leadership experience, relevant skills, critical teacher vacancy, school leadership, student assessment, Leandro, third grade reading, K through 12 governance, and of course, other questions will come up. So let's get to an important question. Um, Dr. Magnum, I'll start with you. One of the greatest challenges facing our school today, of course, COVID-19 and the pandemic. How would you lead our schools specifically through this crisis? When it subsides, what will you do to ensure students get back on track and here's the most important part of this question, to be able to make up for lost educational attainment. Thank you for asking that great question. So first of all, back in June, I created a reopening document with the help of 12 parents and teachers. If you look at it, we did a pretty great job. Uh, what it's gonna take to open is a very specific intentional plan uh, where we think about every scenario that schools have to face because that's what we're hearing from principals and teachers is how do we go in safely and how, what's it going to look like? How are we going to uh, get stu students up to speed? Uh, acceleration is one way. What that means is we don't remediate and slow down and say it extra slow. We push our students with great content, give it to them ahead of time, and give it to them with the, the other people, challenging them. I believe our curriculum has been so watered down, and students ha haven't had rigorous, challenging um, learning. And that's what engages kids, right? I'm a created the STEM TLC, which puts engineering in high poverty schools, and our kids are so excited. So excitement and acceleration will get them to advance. Uh, Catherine Truett, how do you make up for that lost educational attainment specifically? Yeah, so I, I actually believe that acceleration would be a big mistake. We have got to um, prioritize reteaching and relearning the losses that have occurred in both reading and math, even if that means at the expense of other subjects. We already uh, have m more than half of students in, in, in North Carolina in the, in the eighth grade, for example, are not proficient in reading and math going into high school. Uh, in fact, 67% are not. So what my plan would be, would be to reinvigorate the district school transformation center uh, so that we can provide coaching that does um, diagnostic testing, remediation, and then focuses on growth rather than high stakes testing. Dr. Mangum, you have a 30 second rebuttal if you'd like. Yeah, I'm in schools every day. Our students have been, the curriculum's been watered down. They're learning reading strategies for high stakes tests. Remediation doesn't work. You have to engage students in constructive learning, help them understand the big concepts and the big ideas. Um, I totally disagree with treating them like they're so far behind instead of challenging them and raising the expectation. Let's, let's, let's go to a, a point about reading. Let's unpack this idea a little bit more. And again, apologies if it looks like I'm reading. I do wanna make sure that we get the correct uh, uh, terminology and syntax. And by now, most of us know that the third grade reading is critical for students. That is not a surprise. When students shift from learning to read to reading to learn, and yet two thirds of these same students, fourth graders, are not proficient in reading. Um, and I mean, we all know by the national report card. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of short circuiting a couple things. The UNC Board of Governors is now shifting our literacy training to emphasize around the, all of our, our schools of education. And I think you all know, and I'm saying it not clearly as eloquent as maybe you would. So do you think, and this goes to Catherine Truett, do you think, um, how, how do we ensure that all future and current teachers are using the right approach? And then the second part of this question, how important is the science of reading? So I'm going to start with the first question, if I could, and say that every single piece of research that was conducted um, in the with the White House task on on early literacy in the in the early 2000s showed that um, 
a phonics-based direct instruction approach to early literacy is what works. And that is what the science of reading refers to as those, those five pillars of literacy. Um, teaching students how to decode is the way that students learn how to read. Three cueing, whole language, and balanced literacy may have their place later on in instruction, but if students don't learn how to decode, they will not learn how to read. And the data bears that out in our state and in, in, in our country. Um, what we know is that third grade is too late. The State Board of Education had a literacy task force over the summer. Uh, you literally did stop when I put my thumb up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tritt. Dr. Mangrum, same question. If you'd like me to reread it, I will. Yep, I got it. Two questions. So Best NC, you're going to love this. I would like to create a, an institute of teaching and learning, and I need your help. I'd like to place it at Charlotte Hawkins Brown campus, a state historical site, and this institute would bring together our faculties of all our schools of education in North Carolina with our practicing master teachers in literacy. And we would focus not only on effective literacy instruction, and by the way, science of reading means the research that backs reading, so I agree with the National Reading Report. Um, but if we have an institute that focuses on the expertise we have in North Carolina, then one, we're gonna give great professional development to the teachers we have. We're gonna honor them. We're gonna bridge the disconnect between K-12 and our universities. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the rest of the country is gonna say, we wanna to come to North Carolina because that's where you learn how to read. And that's where they understand the prominent black uh, educator, Charlotte Hawkins Brown and elevates her as well. I think it's a win-win, but I need a public private partnership. So best NC, come my way. Okay, thank you. You're all, you're all are being so appropriate that it's throwing me off. So thank you for your compliance. Uh, let, let's, talk, let's talk about a larger organization is um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Catherine, you get the rebuttal. My, my apologies. Oh, well, I, yeah, 30 um, seconds. I, I will just continue and say that um, the Read to Achieve legislation has had some fixes that were offered that are in line with the State Board of Ed recommendations. And I would like to see that not get hung up in a budget stalemate again and get passed in the long session. All right, let, thank you. And, and sorry for that faux pas on my part. Let's go to a larger organizational skills issue because as you both well know, with your organizational experience, whatever it has, it's been, you, you will need to bring it to bear uh, when you sit at top of the educational pillar in North Carolina. As business leaders, uh, many of uh, those that run organizations, both for-profit and non-profit, understand the complexities, the vagaries, these, the, the subtleties of running a large, far-flung organization and the footprint. Please describe the executive leadership experience that you have and how that's prepared you to get ready to be that uh, head of DPI. And then there will be a follow-up question on this for both of you. And then we're going to go to, I think we're going to... Dr. Mangrum? Yes, I yes. get to start. Thank you. Um, leadership is something I started the day I started teaching in 1987. The day I started teaching, I also worked on my master's degree in early childhood. Um, I've been a teacher leader in schools. I was such that my principal asked me to be a literacy facilitator and coach the other teachers in my building. Um, I, when I learned, earned my doctorate, I got awards, did great work there. But then you and, uh, excuse me, NC State Dean Kay Moore saw mm -hmm. something amazing in me. I implemented and created the elementary ed program at NC State. Now you tried to get something through the Board of Governors in 18 months, because I did, and that's a pretty big deal. Um, I co-founded the, the STEM TLC, which is a teacher leader collaborative. We do, um, it was a private partnership where I worked with Duke Energy, as well as um, uh, the so, some Simula Foundation, sorry, uh, helping oh. elementary teachers teach engineering to elementary students. Um, we did the budget. We had over a million dollars. It's still going. I unfortunately had to step out. Um, I work with the National Padilla Center. I'm on their board and deal with their budget, uh, which hasn't been that great with COVID happening. Um, but I have extensive experience, experience as a leader. Um, and I think you can tell I bring energy to that. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Catherine Truitt, same question. Yeah, thank you. I'll start with my time in the governor's office because this role enabled me an opportunity to work collaboratively across all education stakeholders in our state, from pre-K to K-12, to community colleges, to the university system. This, 
that that role allowed me to see um, to, to really look at K-12 education as not just existing in a vacuum. There are things that come before that public education experience and there are consequences when it doesn't go well, which is what we see in our uh, community college system or UNC system as well as workforce development. Right now, the role that I have as chancellor of WGU mm -hmm. North Carolina, um, a lot, I, I lead a team. I have a budget of about $14 million a, e a year. Our organization is fully funded on tuition receipts. The university has no debt. Um, and I collaborate um, with cross-functional teams across the entire country um, because we have 120,000 students across the entire Catherine. Catherine, thank you. And, and again, sorry to interrupt you both when I have to do that. I want to I want to unfold this a little bit more. It is not going to. Oh, yeah, Jan, I'm sorry. You do. You have a rebuttal. I'm so anxious and you've got me so wound up about it. So please go ahead. Uh, at yeah. UNCG, I am the chair of elementary ed. I also am program quarter for our master's of art and teaching. One of the things that we need to think about is teacher prep. And I'm disappointed in WGU. I saw on social media, someone said, I finished my methods courses in two weeks along with some other classes. We can't have high quality teachers if we don't have high quality faculty working with them. I have that extensive experience that I can bring to this position. Chris, you can't let that go. Well, I have to I, be able to respond to that. Well, I, you can, Ms. Truitt, but I, I would like you to do it in the context of possibly another question because we're gonna unpack this a little bit further. We've got two ways to go. So let me start with you, Ms. Truitt, and specifically around the question of when you talk about larger management skills and far-flung organizations and different personalities as we are seeing, how do you approach the idea that the State Board of Education and DPI for many years now have been not at odds per se, but maybe not working together as closely for all of the constituents in North Carolina and certainly the students? And Ms. Truitt, let's start with you. Yeah, so I, I will just say that um, I would like for the group to know that the North Carolina Teacher of the Year is a WGU graduate, as is the regional Roanne Salisbury Teacher of the Year. Um, Competency-based education means that people move at their own pace, and that's why people are able to finish some things uh, more quickly than others, which is the future of education. Um, I, I think that starting off my tenure if elected without a lawsuit would be a great way to start off uh, for four years of new leadership. I would also add that um, the State Board of Education that we have right now is a very high functioning board and they deserve um, a leader who is willing to put politics aside and do what's best for students because that's how this group has been functioning um, for the last four years. Thank you. Dr. Mangrum, same question. question. Yeah, sure. The question was uh, in the spirit of how, how do you get a better, closer, uh, more effective working relationship between the State Board of Education and the Department of Public Instruction? Well, thank you. And I'll say that the rest of the teachers of the year in North Carolina didn't attend WGU. They <laughs> hopefully attended one of our public universities. Um, how I'm going to form that relationship is what I just did. Humor and you know, compassion, but I would say the State Board of Education leaders, some of them have already donated my campaign. I know that I can do this job and they have faith in me too. That means we don't have to worry about avoiding a lawsuit. We're ready to work together. I'm ready to start the next week, the, as soon as we get inaugurated. Um, I think DPI needs some integrity and needs a leader who's like, I've been there, I know what you're doing. Let's, let's talk about how we can work together. Um, people from DPI send me little notes in a bottle <laughs> saying, hurry, get here, um, because we've had chaos. It's been embarrassing. Uh, I am really ready for us to have a non-toxic DPI where people feel valued, educators feel valued, um, and where the state board works hand in hand with, with, with the state uh, superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Mangrum. And this was a separate question. Uh, so Catherine Truett, you have a 30 second rebuttal. Um, no rebuttal for me. Thanks. Okay. Um, in an op-ed recently, just last week, in fact, Judge Manning, Howard Manning, stated that the, and I quote, the primary cause of failure to achieve grade level performance in reading is not money, but a failure in classroom instruction and the leadership in a school. How do you respond to these comments? And Dr. Mangrum, is it, I, I, and apologize, let, let me ask my, uh, uh, Yes, Dr. Mangrum, we are going to you first, so thank you. Repeat it again. Who said that? Could yes. You it again? Uh, last week in an op-ed, 
Judge Howard Manning stated that the primary cause of failure to achieve grade level performance in reading is not money, but a failure of classroom instruction and leadership in a school. How do you respond to that comment? So Judge Manning and I had a fundraiser together, my first one, and we had extensive hours of conversation. And what you're going to find about me as a leader is I can value you and respect you and not always see eye to eye. I agree with him that teachers haven't had the professional development and some of the instruction they need over the past two decades to teach reading. I agree with them there. Mm -hmm. But I also think we need to invest, just like the West Ed report said, um, in ways that will support teachers in teaching reading. I think having a teacher assistant back in the classroom is vital. And over the last 10 years, we've slashed 7,500 teaching assistants. That was Governor Hunt's part of his reading program, is let's put another person in K-3 classrooms. So while I understand where uh, Judge Manning's coming from, uh, we do need to focus on instruction, but we also need to add more dollars to our budget. Ms. Truitt? I, yeah, I think the, the question is, do we need to add $8 billion more dollars over eight years, as the, the recommendation states? I, I think that in order to move forward with this conversation, we have to be honest about the fact that over the last 35 years, uh, since even before the Leandro lawsuit, lawsuit was filed, that no matter how much money has been spent and no matter which political party has been in charge, our gaps in achievement for low-income students and students of color have remained the same. So we've, we've not been able to, dis, despite the amount of money that, that, that's been given um, and is being given, uh, we do fund our low-income schools at a rate of 33% more than our non-low-income schools in North Carolina. And in fact, some of our highest um, uh, schools with the, the most appropriation are actually have, have the worst income. So we can't keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome. Dr. Magnum, you have a, a rebuttal. Yeah, um, I, I taught in the eighties and nineties and we know when we invested and had, we had sustained improvement. We actually were above the national norms in our scores and we closed the achievement gap more than any other state in the nineties. Mm -hmm. What we can't keep doing is we can't keep uh, adding more charter schools, cutting master pay, slashing our teaching assistants, throwing in vouchers, defunding uh, the teaching fellows program, blocking schools from construction bonds, taking away teachers' health care. Those are the things we can't keep doing, and they're going to cost us investing in schools. Uh, we're about halfway through now, uh, roughly, and I want to I want to ask a simple question, which of course will re the, the same format we've been is is candidate answer, uh, respond, and then rebuttal. And the and this question goes to Miss Catherine Truitt first. And the, the question is pretty simple. It's from a uh, someone who is viewing, and that is, uh, should the the role of state superintendent be appointed or elected? I absolutely believe and have said from the beginning that this role should not be elected. I don't like the word appointed because it, that, that assumes that it's like a political appointment. I think it should follow um, the way we do the community college presidency. We need to have a search and um, this person needs to go through a rigorous interview process and it, there needs to be a unanimous board decision over who, gets, who, who ends up in this role. Um, the, um, the political nature of an election or the, the, you know, obviously by nature, an election is political means that, um, candidates are, are fundraising, um, and having to prioritize things that go into a political campaign, um, rather than perhaps doing what's best for education. And I firmly believe that if we um, conducted this more like, like an interview, like we have in other government, other education entities across the state, that students would win. Dr. Manger? Yeah, I've thought about this a lot. And I realized that through an election process, the entire state of North Carolina gets to have a voice in their students' education. That's what this is about. This is parents and teachers and anyone who is, you know, uh, a, a supporter of public education has a voice and they have a vote. And I think that's really important. You know, um, the most important person in the Senate is the president pro tem. And he's not voted on across the state. They used to be, because that position used to be in power with lieutenant governor. 
you know, if we don't allow people the elective election process, then we're denying them that voice in the direction. Because right now, um, my opponent wants to take education in a different direction than I do. Um, and so we're going to let the people decide. And I think that's really important. Ms. Truett, you have a 30-second rebuttal. No rebuttal from me. Okay. Let's move it along. The uh, land, landmark decision case around Leandro that began in the uh, mid-1990s, uh, and many of you know better than I do that this is about sound basic education for every student, for every family in North Carolina. And finally, Howard, uh, Judge Howard Lee brought it to bear and is compelling it now on the state of North Carolina. So let's talk about this a little bit. The Leandro case focuses primarily on ensuring that all of these students have the same access, effective teachers and school leaders. And yet, in North Carolina, like most states, we struggle every year to recruit high quality teachers to our hardest to staff subject areas, as well as the high, highest poverty schools. So uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Mangrum and ask you this question. What strategies would you suggest to fill those specific positions? Well, the first thing we have to do is raise the teacher's salary, raise the wage. And the governor has suggested the national average. I think that's fine. I think when um, we need to approach high school students and high school cadet programs to let them see how um, important and impactful teaching is. But I also think when students step on a college campus, that's when they're deciding what their career is going to be. And they can choose chemistry or chemistry teaching. And if they choose teaching, they're only going to make about 75% of what they would make if they chose the field. So we're going to have to level it so that our students on campus feel as though they can go into teaching and not take such a huge loss. Uh, we have to recruit uh, teachers of color. We should be in HBCUs. We should be talking to teachers of color, asking them to help us think about the best ways to recruit. We know when you recruit a teacher of color, students of color do better um, achievement wise. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do. We have to change the narrative. The Pew poll says that 50% of parents don't want their children to be teachers. We got to change that. Ms. Tripp? Yeah, so um, uh, Dr. Mangrum's example is a per, uh, of the chemistry teacher is a perfect example of why uh, something that I think really needs to change, that an example of something that we cannot continue to do the same way anymore, and that's the way we fund teachers. The way we fund teachers creates automatic inequities in dollars as well as in teacher quality. Um, I believe that converting position allotments to dollars and giving principals flexibility to pay for what they need um, with, with, those, with that, those monies and do some creative staffing is the best way to go uh, to, to fill critical vacancies like math and, and science teachers. Let the salary scale being a starting point and, and build from there. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working with uh, superintendents from rural low income counties to offer a scholarship for our TAs who want to become licensed teachers but can't quit their jobs to return to school full time. Dr. Magrum, follow, um, rather a rebuttal. Yeah, superintendents overall want to keep the allotments as is. So, so that's not um, something that, that could really work. Um, also, we have 1,698 positions in teaching that were vacant in 1819 on day 40. Um, 600 of those were in elementary school. So we need teachers across the board, not just chemistry teachers or math teachers. We need teachers in general. And so I want to go out there and galvanize people and excite them about teaching. Yeah, I want to ask you both this question before we leave the Leandro uh, uh, line of questioning. And uh, Ms. Truett, I'll, I'll start with you and then we'll go back and forth as we've done in the past. And that is a pretty simple question. It was December of 2019. So we're coming up on a year since the courts compelled Leandro. There was a lot of excitement about Leandro within the state of North Carolina. And we're coming up now on the year anniversary. Ms. Truett, do you feel like there is enough momentum and it is not being lost in policy and COVID-19 and every other challenge that we have in front of us, that Leandro is not at risk of losing momentum, but still will be implemented as everyone hopes. Yeah, I do not believe that we are at risk of losing momentum. Um, in fact, the State Board of Education uh, two or three weeks ago um, appointed Dr. Bev Emery as the executive director of Leandro. She will have a dual reporting role to the department and to the State Board of Education. Um, and she will be uh, in charge of overseeing Leandro compliance. 
Um, the board is also working um, with the legislature to make sure that there is um, there are checks and guardrails in place to ensure Leandro compliance. I think that um, our, our district leaders are very excited and want to see this work continue. And I, I look forward as um, the state superintendent if elected to helping parents understand what's going on with Leandro because a lot of, a lot of people I meet on the campaign trail are not aware of, of the magnitude of this lawsuit which is really the most con consequential court ruling since Brown versus Board of Education. Dr. Manger. Yeah, this isn't about momentum. Uh, I, I think that's the wrong question. It's a, it's a moral question that we have. As a state, are we willing to do what it takes so that every child flourishes, so that every child has a sound basic education? And not only does that mean recruiting and retaining and supporting great teachers and great principals, it also means investing in public education. Um, you know, you can't teach if you don't have the resources to do it. You can't help children with their social emotional well being if you don't have nurses, social workers, school psychologists, you know, counselors. We have been doing without. I mentioned all the things we've been cutting. Um, it's a moral decision. What do we value, North Carolina? If we value every child and we value high quality education, then we need to do the things that need to be done. And by the way, the West Ed report didn't suggest 8 billion, it suggested 3.7 billion. I think we can do that if we quit giving corporate tax cuts. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Ms. Truitt, you have a rebuttal if you'd like. Yeah, what, what I said is that it's requiring 8 billion over eight years. So it's, it's, it's actually more than 3.7 billion. Um, yeah, what I would say is that, um, again, it's it, yes, no one's arguing that we need more investments, but the question is, what are we going to do differently with that money? What we do with the money, the money itself is not a panacea. We, and what we've been doing, the, the, the data shows this, teachers are working harder than ever before, and yet we have not closed the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem that spans multiple administrations. It's, it's not a political problem, it is a, uh, a people problem that has to be solved. We have to figure out how we're going to um, do a better job with the money that we have and the money that's coming. Okay. All right, thank you, Ms. Truitt. Um, I wanna remind everyone watching, if you have a question, uh, comment, or that leads to a question, please use on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat function. Just click on that button and you can send your question to Brenda Berg who will share it with me and we'll do our best to get it into this dialogue. We are about 15 minutes left in this discussion. So let's continue on. Uh, uh, Ms. Berg, remind me who got the last question? <laughs> there's, there's so many moving parts here. D Dr. Mangum, okay, you get, the, you get the next question. So let's, uh, let's, let's start in. A recent national poll of parents found that 89% of parents 89% of parents are interested in information on how school closures and other COVID-related interruptions affect students' long-term outcomes, as many are. 65% want to know the amount of academic progress students have made uh, when schools were closed. Given that we did not have end-of-grade testing last year, interestingly enough, how important is it to conduct student assessments this year as we enter the next school year and what might that look like? Yeah. It's always Im important to assess students. It's about how we assess them and how we use the assessment that really is the difference. Um, I wanna take a moment because you're talking about when we reopen. Um, and this is very sad, but we had a third grade teacher in Stanley County die yesterday. It's the second uh, education educator in North Carolina to die of COVID-19. So reopening is important. But I have always said we have got to go about this strategically and intentionally with a plan. So I love the question you're asking because it's saying, okay, when we get in, you know, how are we going to know how students are doing? Because parents want to know. And I get that. But I also know that 62% of parents are concerned about their children and their health and their safety. Um, and I think that's a larger question, a more important question to begin with. Um, and I wanted to raise this teacher up because, um, you know, our teachers give everything. My mom died 30 minutes before school started when I was 14. And, and Catherine's heard the story over and over again. But I know what it's like to live through trauma. And I know what it's like to walk into a school building uh, having experienced that. 
Okay, Ms. Trent. Could you repeat the question again, please? Sure, um, and forgive me, it's, it's a bit long, but I wanna make sure I get it all in there accurately. It was a national, a recent national poll of parents found that 89% of parents are interested in information about how school closures and other corona related interruptions affect students' long-term outcomes and 65% of parents wanna know the amount of academic progress the students made when the schools were closed. Given that we uh, do not have end of grade of testing, or given that we did not have end of, end of grade testing last year, how important is it to conduct student assessments this year and as we enter the next school year and what might that look like? Yes, I, I agree that we, um, with the waivers that the, that the feds gave us this year on the, that end of grade testing, I think that at the root of this question and, and this data from parents is that um, our current assessment and accountability system does not provide parents with the data they're seeking. Um, and it doesn't uh, let parents know how their children are, are faring, um, where they're behind, what they need to be doing differently. And so I, I think that we, you know, I, I've said in the past, we need to get rid of EOCs and EOGs as we know them and go with a, a nationally normed test. Um, and I would like to see more formative assessments along the way, like our NC check-ins model. But this goes back to your first question. Um, we, we've got to have diagnostic testing that shows parents where their children are. When Thank we you. Dr. Megum, you have a rebuttal, 30 yeah. seconds, please. One thing I'd like to share that maybe people in Best NC don't know, but if you're an eight-year-old and you take this, this test, this EOG, um, your report that goes home to your parents, if you're proficient or below, says your child is not on trajectory to be college or career ready. That is not how we motivate students around learning. That is not how we engage them in reading. So it's not just about the data, it's how we share it with parents as well, right? Um, because we don't want eight-year-olds saying, yeah, party's over, can't go to college or get a good job. Um, and so I think we really need to think about how okay. we're stigmatizing kids. Let, let, let's go a little bit further on this specific thing. And I wanna ask you both one more question and we'll go through the same uh, 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 structure of question response and then rebuttal. And that is, as we think about EOGs, end of grade testing, as we think about the possibility of being creative around and in the face of COVID, how do you allow, first question, and it's a, I hope it's not a little opaque, but how do you allow yourself to be creative enough if you are state superintendent of education to think that, um, and, and of course, this is my term, that we uh, maybe think of a hybrid EOG or a way for us to look at how we assess the kids as it is, as they are living right now and how we allow ourselves to lead in with creativity as being a state superintendent in what has been um, somewhat of a rigid system. And I'll start with you, Ms. Drew. I, I think that when I was a teacher, I was so afraid to tr be creative and try new things because there was always this culture of fear of failure because there were repercussions for that. And I think that um, that is true at the state level as well. Um, it's, it's, it's dangerous to fail when you are responsible for a million and a half students across the state. But at the same time, we have to, at the department, um, have a culture where we can learn from our mistakes and um, not be fearful to be creative so that we can, again, as I've said a couple of times tonight, do, do things differently. One thing that I would love to do differently is move to a competency-based model of education and performance-based assessments. Uh, Dr. Mangrum, same question. If you'd like me to repeat it, I will. No, I'm good. Chris, a friend of mine wrote, creativity, the new smart. I think you're really on to something, right? I taught in the 80s and 90s, from 87 to 2000. 2000 was no child left behind and accountability became the word. Uh, when I taught, we didn't have tests that penalized anyone. We used the California Achievement Test, some used the Iowa Basic Skills Test, but it was a, a norm test. It just wasn't used to, pen, uh, to punish anybody. I'm gonna go back to what I said before. In the 80s and 90s, with sustained investment, we had scores above the national average and we were closing the gap more than any other state in the country. 
So when you talk about being cre creative, part of it is learning from what we did in the past. Accountability hasn't worked in the 2000s. And then the past 10 years of all this mismanagement and cuts in education have only made it worse. We need to start thinking about what does good teaching look like and how do we support it instead of big, big test, big tech. Catherine, you have a rebuttal? Yeah, so um, accountability and, and testing are um, very important things in education and punitive accountability and testing and accountability are uh, not mutually exclusive or they are mutually exclusive, excuse me. So um, what I would say is that the, the way that, I mean, when I, the, the, the legacy of No Child Left Behind is that we finally saw for the first time as a nation what our um, disaggregated data looked like for reading and math uh, when it came to Hispanic and African-American okay. students. All right, Thank, I, I wish we had more time on the rebuttals, especially because you all start to get some momentum and, and really get some traction. And, and we have to stay within the guardrails because it's appropriate. We have two more questions and then we're gonna allow for uh, one minute closing statements. Let me get to the second of the last questions. Um, uh, what is your position in North Carolina's school of, uh, what, what is your position on the North Carolina school performance grades? And what is, we've used this term a lot during this dialogue and during this debate, and what is your, and what is the role of accountability in education? It's my turn, right? It's your turn, yes. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Diane Ravitch, who was the deputy superintendent, uh, deputy U.S. secretary of education under George Bush, was very much involved in No Child Left Behind and this idea of accountability. She endorsed me and supports me, and I talk to her regularly. She, about five years into it, she went, whoa, this isn't working. Um, you cannot uh, reward people to work better and you can't punish people to get them to work harder. Um, and so accountability became a method of privatization. If we give a school a bad grade, nobody's going to want to go there, right? That's how we dismantle schools. Teachers don't want to work in schools when we label them D's and F's. Instead of we should go in and support these schools. We know what works in education, but we're not doing it. Instead, we're pointing fingers at teachers, at parents, at kids, at schools of ed, when we really need to go in and do what we know and support them. I do not agree with the A through F system. We're about the only state in the country that does it, uh, other than Florida. Um, we really need to think about how to lift our schools up, not beat them down. Mm -hmm. Ms. Tripp? I do not agree with the A through F system either. I believe that we should have two separate standalone measurements so that we can, um, have a picture of how a school is um, delivering education to its, its students. And um, that also helps parents understand where their children are. We do have to have um, uh, some testing. I don't think that it needs to be what we would all deem as high stakes testing that is incredibly stressful as, as well for children as well as punitive for teachers and principals. Um, but we also need to be equally focused on growth and the, 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 the rate of improvement. So um, I would like, to, if, if those two things were in equal measure um, and those two grades were posted on a website, I, I would have no problem with that. Dr. Mangum, you have a rebuttal. Yeah. I would like to see us move from a pandemic tragedy to a post-pandemic transformation where, where accountability is about what's creativity look like in your building? What's the social and emotional wealth and well-being of your students? Um, what's the climate like in your school? You know, how, how much are parents involved and engaged? I'd like to see community schools. I think there's a way to hold schools accountable without it being about achievement scores only. I'm, I'm sorry, I was responding to that. Uh, okay. Uh, and you, you, your time was up, but it was also, let, let, let me ask you both a follow-up to that. And it seems a little bit arcane, but um, as we reflect, and we've talked about this public health care crisis that has upended many families and put uh, children at risk, put families at risk, have, has eviscerated incomes and economies and ex so on and so forth. Um, as a leader of, an edu of the education in North Carolina, what would you do? How would you right now, beginning in the fall, after the, after the day of the election, 
what would you do to calm people to be a convener of the ideas, all ideas? How would you approach the idea of bringing people together around what public education should be in North Carolina? And we will start with you, Ms. Truitt. The first thing that I would do, aside from getting, you know, getting the house in order, so to speak, uh, and, and building that bridge with the State Board of Education would definitely be to engage with superintendents on a listening tour. They, they have um, a lot of frustrations. They have a lot to tell us. And it's going to be different, vastly different from county to county. And I think that their feedback will inform so much of how I would approach what needs to happen next. But there's a couple of key positions that need to be filled at the department, um, I believe, in order to um, deliver on our promises of a sound basic education. And, and that is one of those roles is um, the Office of Early Learning. That is something that has got to be prioritized. I would love to see us launch a statewide literacy campaign that um, engages parents and communities in the process for improving early literacy outcomes. Because mm -hmm. right now, what we know is that um, the majority of students are not able to fulfill their post-secondary aspirations. Thank you. Dr. Mangrum? I, I don't remember exactly how you said it, but you talked about you know, just how families have been torn apart with you know, income issues and um, other issues around the pandemic. And I want to be in schools day one. And I want to go see families day one um, with my mask and all prepared. But I know that people have are hurting. I know that. And the, the best way to, to help someone is to listen and to learn and to listen some more. I think the best places to start are the five rural districts that were part of Leandro and let them know I'm here for you. Um, I also think we have to go far out west. Our Western uh, communities feel so left out. Uh, you know, they, sometimes they're closer to Tennessee, right? Or Georgia than they are to, to Raleigh. So I think it's really important that I get out and be with people and let them know that I'm listening and, and tell them some of my ideas mm -hmm. around education and how I'm gonna lift their children up and help them be uh, successful. Thank you, Mr. 30-second 30, 30 rebuttal. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I, I appreciate Dr. Mangarum's desire to get out and be with people. We have challenges that we should have solved yesterday. And that what she's describing is the role of the superintendent in a district, not the role of the state superintendent. We have got to get um, moving with our, with our local superintendents, our local school boards, and filter up what needs to be done and start on day one, reaching back into the schools and giving these districts the, the support that they need. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are now in the last question and it's one that you are not prepared for uh, intentionally. Are we prepared why. for the other ones? Wait, so, yeah, <laughs> you'll see why in a second, but uh, in the interest of civil discourse, in the interest of bringing us together, um, and Dr. Mangram, we'll start with you. What do you like about your opponent's platform that you would be open maybe to adopting, but certainly being uh, sympathetic toward? Oh, gosh, you know, uh, th what a great question. Uh, Catherine brings a lot of things to the table. Um, and I don't, I, I haven't had the chance to tell her, right? But, you know, she's very much about literacy, which we know is critical in the early years. And I fully appreciate that. Um, she also wants to do right for kids when you when you hear her speak. Um, and I think that's important because I don't think our current superintendent uh, feels the same. And I also like that, you know, she's been asked about our current superintendent multiple times and she speaks out because she knows that's something I value too. Like when we see something's not working as strong women leaders, we need to say, that's not working and, I, and I'm not gonna pretend like it is. So those are just some of the things I appreciate, appreciate about her. Um, but I'm definitely, while I'm her opponent, I definitely respect her highly. Thank you. Ms. Truitt, same question. Yeah, thanks. We were talking before all the guests came on. Jenna and I have probably had, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 15 of, of these debates. And so we've gotten to hear a lot about um, how, how we both would, would do this work. And, 
one of the things that I really respect about Jen is her passion for educators um, and, and her desire to, um, to engage in the classroom and to give teachers the supports that they need. It's very clear that she has educators at heart and wants what's best for them so that they can in turn do what's best for their students. Um, she's in incredibly in tune with what their needs are. And um, that, you know, people say all the time, well, does this role really require someone who has been a teacher? The answer is yes, because, and, and Jen is a perfectly good example of that because she knows exactly what it's like to be in the trenches and uh, the struggles that our teachers face each and every day. And I um, really admire that. Lady, ladies, well said. We're going to stop short of asking you to vote for each other. But that was <laughs> Thank we you. Let's well. just cancel them out. <laughs> yeah. We'll have a drink later. Uh, well, you do. All you, done. You, you both do finish each other's sentences in some way. So we are now at the, at the closing and we would like you to literally take a minute each and tell us why you are the best candidate for North Carolina superintendent of public instruction. And we will start with. Catherine. Catherine True. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <Dr. laughs> Education is still the surest pathway to opportunity in this country, but I know that we are not educating all kids. And simply put, we are not educating all kids because the system in which we are all operating in is broken. I know this because despite, despite working harder than ever, um, and teachers are working harder than ever, we have not improved outcomes for kids for over 35 years, regardless of which party has been in charge and how much money we've spent. We have to do a better job with the money that we are given. Um, we have a system that requires students to adjust to it rather than the other way around. I hope that you all see in me a leader who wants to put students at the center of every decision that we make and a leader who believes that schools exist for students. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Dr. Magnum, you get the last word. Thank you. I see myself as a visionary. And while my opponent doesn't think I should be out in the field, it's so important that people across North Carolina know who the superintendent is and know that we care specifically for their district and their schools. Um, that's one of the reasons Best NC has the reputation that it does because you come from across the state, you are leaders in your communities, you know what your communities need and you bring that to us, to the superintendent. What I hope will happen is that, that Best NC won't tell DPI what to do and DPI won't tell Best NC what to do, but there'll be a true collaboration where we can make magic happen for North Carolina. I'm excited that I believe we can be the state that the rest of the country looks to um, because we are going to make such gains. We are going to really care about the well being of our children and it's going to show. Um, I think that I'm obviously the, the most qualified. I'm an advocate for schools and kids, and I appreciate your time today. I hope I can count on your support on November 3rd. Um, ladies, Dr. Jen Mangrum, Ms. Catherine Truitt. Uh, I suspect that after election day, whomever is elected to this office, that there will be no winners and losers listening to you both today. But also, I suspect that the, the, the real winners will be the people of North Carolina, the kids and the families, because of your dedication and because you're willing to step out and step up and take this job. We'd like to thank Best NC to, uh, to bring this dialogue. We'd like to thank you both. Thank you to Brenda Berg and Chairman Walter McDowell. And if you'd like to watch a replay of this or if you'd like to share this video, please do. You go to bestnc.org. It's all one word, bestnc.org. I thank you all for joining us. Best of luck to you all. Thank you and good night.